where I think this is a good opportunity to try to sneak up to the idea of enlightenment. Uh, so you wrote a series of good tweets about consciousness and panpsychism. So let's break it down. First you say, I suspect the experience that leads to the panpsychism syndrome of some philosophers and other consciousness enthusiasts represents the realization that we don't end at the self, but share a resonant universe representation with every other observer coupled to the same universe. This actually eventually leads us to a lot of interesting questions about AI and AGI, but let's start with this representation. What is this resonant universe representation? Um, and what do you think? Do we share such a representation? The neuroscientist um, Grossberg has come up with the cognitive architecture that he calls the adaptive resonance theory. And his perspective is that our neurons can be understood as oscillators that are resonating with each other and with outside phenomena. So the coarse-grained model of the universe that we are building, in some sense, is a resonance with objects and outside of us in the world. So basically, we take up patterns that uh, of the universe that we are coupled with, and our brain is not so much understood as circuitry, even though this perspective is valid, but it's um, almost an ether in which the individual neurons are passing on mm -hmm. uh, chemoelectrical signals or arbitrary uh, signals across all modalities that can be transmitted between cells, stimulate each other in this way, and produce patterns that they modulate while passing them on. Mm -hmm. And this speed of signal progression in the brain is roughly at the speed of sound, incidentally, because the uh, time that it takes for the signals to hop from cell to cell, which means it's relatively slow with respect to the world. It takes an appreciable fraction of a second for a signal to go through the entire neocortex, something like a few hundred milliseconds. And so there's a lot of stuff happening in that time where the signal is passing through your brain, including in the brain itself. So nothing in the brain is assuming that stuff happens simultaneously. Everything in the brain is working in a paradigm where the world has already moved on when you are very, uh, ready to do the next thing to your signal, including the signal processing system itself. It's quite a different paradigm than the one in our digital computers, where we currently assume that um, your uh, GPU or CPU is pretty much globally in the same state. So you mentioned there the non-dual state and say that some people confuse it for enlightenment. Yeah. What's the non-dual state? There is a state in which you uh, notice that you are no longer a person, and uh, instead you are one with the universe. So that's the, and this, that speaks to the resonance. Yes, and, but this one with the universe is, of course, not accurately modeling that you are indeed um, some god entity or indeed the universe is becoming aware of itself, even though you get this experience. I believe that you get this experience because your uh, mind is modeling the fact that you are no longer identified with the personal self in that state, but you have transcended this division between the self model and the world model mm -hmm. and you're experiencing yourself as your mind as something that is representing a universe but that's still part of the model yes so it's inside of the model still you're in, yep. still inside of patterns that are generated in your brain and in your organism and uh, what you are now experiencing is that you're no longer this personal self in there but you are the entirety of the mind and the, its contents why is it so hard to get there a lot of people who get into the state think this or are associated with enlightenment. I suspect it's a favorite training goal for a number of meditators. But um, uh, I think that enlightenment is in some sense more mundane and it's a step further or sideways. It's the state where you realize that everything is a representation. Yeah, you say enlightenment is a realization of how experience is implemented. Yes. So basically, you notice at some point that your qualia can be deconstructed. Reverse engineered? What, like a, almost like a schematic of it? What, what? Uh... You can start with uh, looking at a face. Maybe look at your own face in the mirror. Yeah. Look at uh, your face for a few hours in the mirror or for a few minutes. At some point, it will look very weird. And you, mm -hmm. because you notice that there's actually no face. You basically start unseeing the face. What you see is a geometry. And then you can disassemble the geometry and realize how that geometry is being constructed in your mind. And you can learn to modify this. So basically you can uh, change these generators in your own mind uh, to shift the face around or to uh, change the construction of the face, to uh, change the way in which the features are being assembled. Why don't we do that more often? Why don't we 
start really messing with reality without the use of drugs or anything else? Why don't we get good at this kind of thing? Like uh, um, intentionally. Uh, why should we? Why would because you, you can that? morph reality into something more pleasant for yourself. Just have fun with it. Yeah, that is probably what you shouldn't be doing, right? Because outside of your personal self, this yeah. outer mind is probably a relatively smart agent. And what you often notice is that you have thoughts about how you should live, yeah. but you observe yourself doing different things and having different feelings. And that's because your outer mind doesn't believe you and doesn't believe your rational thoughts. Well, the, can't you just silence the outer mind? The thing is that the outer mind is usually smarter than you are. Rational thinking is very brittle. Mm. It's very hard to use logic and symbolic thinking to have an accurate model of the world. So there is often an underlying system that is looking at your rational thoughts and then tells you, no, you're still missing something. Your gut feeling is still saying something else. And this can be, for instance, you find a partner that looks perfect or you find a deal and you uh, build a company or whatever that looks perfect to you. And yet at some level you feel something is off and you cannot put your finger on it. And the more you reason about it, the better it looks to you. But the system that is uh, outside still tells you, no, no, you're missing something. And that system is powerful. People call this intuition, right? Intuition is this unreflected part of your uh, attitude composition and computation where you produce a, a model of how you relate to the world and what you need to do it in it and what you can do in it and what's going to happen that is usually deeper and um, often more accurate than your reason. So if we look at this as you write in the tweet, if we look at this more rigorously as a sort of take the panpsychist idea more seriously, almost as a scientific discipline. You write that quote, fascinatingly, the panpsychist interpretation seems to lead to observations of practical results to a degree that physics fundamentalists might call superstitious. Reports of long distance tele telepathy and remote causation are ubiquitous in the general population. I am not convinced, says Yosha Bach, that establishing the empirical reality of telepathy would force an update of any part of serious academic physics, but it could trigger an important revolution in both neuroscience and AI from a circuit perspective to a coupled complex resonator paradigm. Are you suggesting that uh, there could be some rigorous uh, mathematical wisdom to panpsychist perspective on the world? So first of all, panpsychism is the perspective that consciousness is inseparable from matter in the universe. And I find panpsychism quite unsatisfying because it does not explain consciousness, but right? it does not explain how this aspect of matter produces it. It's also when I try to formalize panpsychism and write down what it actually means and with a more formal mathematical language, it's very difficult to distinguish it from uh, saying that there is a software side to the world in the same way as there is a software side to what the transistors are doing in your computer. So basically, there is a pattern at a certain coarse graining of the universe that in some reasons of the universe leads to observers that are observing themselves. Right. So panpsychism maybe is not even, when I, I write it down, a position that is distinct from functionalism. But um, intuitively, um, a lot of people feel that the activity of matter itself, of mechanisms in the world, is insufficient to explain it. So Uh, it's something that needs to be intrinsic to matter itself. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, apart from this abstract idea, have an experience in which you experience yourself as being the universe, mm -hmm. which I suspect is basically happening because you manage to dissolve the um, division between personal self and mind that you establish as an infant when you construct the personal self and transcend it again and understand how it works. Um, but there is something deeper that is that you feel that you're also sharing a state with other people, that you um, have an experience in which you notice that your personal self is moving into everything else, that you basically look out of the eyes of another person, that um, every agent in the world that is an observer is in some sense you. So if we, and we forget that we are the same agent. So... Is it that we feel that or do we actually accomplish it? So is telepathy possible? Is it real? 
So for me, that's this a question that I don't really know the answer to. In uh, Turing's famous 1950 paper in which he describes the Turing test, he does speculate about telepathy, interestingly, and asks himself um, if telepathy is real, and he thinks that it very well might be, what uh, it would be the implication for AI systems that try to be intelligent? Because he didn't see a mechanism by which a computer program would become telepathic. And I suspect if telepathy would exist, or if all the reports that uh, you get from people when you ask the normal person on the street, um, I find that very often they uh, say, I have experiences with telepathy. The scientists might not be interested in this and might not have a theory about this, but I have difficulty explaining it away. And so you could say maybe this is a superstition, or maybe it's a false memory, or maybe it's a little bit of psychosis, who knows? Uh, maybe somebody wants to make their own life more interesting or misremember something. But a lot of people report, um, I noticed something terrible happened to my partner and I know this is exactly the moment it happened where uh, my child had an accident and I knew that was happening and the child was in a different town. Right? So uh, maybe it's a false memory where this is later on mistakenly attributed, but a lot of people think that this is not the correct explanation. So if something like this was real, what would it mean? probably would mean that either your body is an antenna that is sending information over all sorts of channels, like um, maybe just electromagnetic um, radio signals that you're sending over long distances and you get attuned to another person that you spend enough time with to uh, get a few bits out of the ether yeah. to uh, figure out what this person is doing. Or maybe it's also when you are very close to somebody and you become empathetic with them, what happens that is that you go into a resonance state with them, right? Similar to when people go into a seance and they um, go into a trance state and they start shifting a VR board around on the table. I think what happens is that they their minds go by their nervous systems into a resonant state in which they basically create something like a shared dream between them. Physical closeness or closeness broadly defined? With physical closeness, it's uh, much easier to experience empathy with someone, yeah. right? It's, I, I suspect it would be difficult for me to have uh, empathy for you if you were in a different town also. Um, how, how would that work? But if you are very close to someone, you pick up all sorts of signals from their body, not just via your eyes, but with your entire body. Mm -hmm. And um, if the nervous system sits on the other side and the intercellular communication sits on the other side and is integrating over all these signals, you can make inferences about the state of the other. And it's not just the personal self that does this via reasoning, but your perceptual system. And what basically happens is that your interact uh, representations are directly interacting. It's the physical... Um, resonant models of the universe that exist in your nervous system and in your body might go into resonance with others and start sharing some of their states. So you basically buy next to a big next to somebody, you pick up some of their vibes <laughs> and uh, feel without looking at them what they're feeling in this moment. And it's difficult for you uh, if you're very empathetic to detach yourself from it and uh, have an emotional state that is completely independent from your environment. People who are highly empathetic, are describing this. And now imagine that uh, a lot of organisms in, in, on this planet have representations of the environment and operate like this, and they are adjacent to each other and overlapping, so there's going to be some degree in which there is basically some chained interaction, and we are uh, forming some slightly shared representation. And no relatively few neuroscientists who consider this possibility, I think, big. Um, um, a rarity in this regard is uh, Michael Levin, who is mm -hmm. considering these things in earnest. And uh, I stumbled on this train of thought mostly by um, noticing that the tasks of a neuron can be fulfilled by other cells as well. They can send different typed chemical messages and physical messages to their adjacent cells and learn when to do this and when not, make this conditional and become universal function approximators. The only thing that they cannot do is telegraph information over axons very quickly over long distances, right? So neurons in this perspective are specially adapted kind of telegraph cell that uh, has evolved so we can move our muscles very fast but um, our body is in principle able to also make models of the world just much, much slower. Mm -hmm. It's interesting though, that at this time, at least in human history, there seems to be a gap between the tools of science and uh, the ex subjective experience that people report, like you're talking about with telepathy and 
it seems like we're not quite there. No, I think that there is no gap between the tools of science and telepathy. Either it's there or it's not, and it's an empirical question. And if it's there, we should be able to detect it in a lab. Mm -hmm. So why is there not a lot of Michael Levins walking around? I, I don't think that Michael Levin is uh, specifically focused on telepathy very much. He is focused on self-organization in uh, living organisms and in brains. Uh, both as a paradigm for development and as a paradigm for information processing. And when you think about how organization processing works in organisms, there is, first of all, radical locality, which means everything is decided locally from the perspective of an individual cell. The individual cell is the agent. And the other one is coherence. Basically, there needs to be some criterion that uh, determines how these cells are interacting in such a way that order emerges on the next level of structure. Mm -hmm. And this principle of coherence, of um, imposing constraints that uh, are not uh, validated by the individual parts and lead to coherent structure, um, to basically transcendental agency where you form an agent on the next level of organization is uh, crucial in this perspective. It's so cool that radical locality leads to the emergence of complexity at, yeah. at the higher layers. And I think what Mike Levin is looking at is, is nothing that is outside of the realm of science in any way. It's just that he is a, a paradigmatic thinker mm -hmm. who develops his own paradigm. Mm -hmm. And most of the neuroscientists are um, using a different paradigm at this point. And this often happens in science that a field is, has a few paradigms in which people try to understand reality and build concepts and make experiments. You're kind of one of those type of paradigmatic thinkers. Actually, if we can take a tangent on that, once again, returning to the biblical verses of your tweets. <laughs> uh, you write, my public explorations are not driven by audience service, but by my lack of ability for discovering, understanding, or following the relevant authorities. So I have to develop my own thoughts. Since I think autonomously, these thoughts cannot always be very good. That's you apologizing for the chaos of your thoughts, or perhaps not apologizing, just identifying. Yeah, but let me ask mm -hmm. the question. Uh, since we talked about Michael Levin and yourself, who I think are very kind of uh, radical, big, independent thinkers, uh, can we reverse engineer your process of thinking autonomously? How do you do it? How can humans do it? How can you avoid being influenced by, uh, what is it, stage, stage three? Well, why would you want to do that? It's uh, you see what is working for you, and if it's uh, not working for you, you build another structure that works better for you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I f found myself in when I was thrown into this world in a state where my intuitions were not working for me. I was not able to um, understand how I would be able to survive in this world and build the things that I was interested in, build the kinds of relationship I needed to build. Um, work on the topics that I uh, wanted to make progress on. And so I had to learn. And I, for me, Twitter is not some tool of publication. It's not something where I put stuff that I entirely believe to be true and provable. It's an interactive notebook in which I explore possibilities. And I found that when I tried to understand how the mind and how consciousness works, I was quite optimistic. I thought there need to, uh, needs to be a big body of knowledge that I can just study and that works. And so I entered um, studies in philosophy and computer science and um, later psychology and a bit of neuroscience and so on. And I was disappointed by uh, what I found because I found that the questions of how consciousness and so on works, how emotion uh, works, how it's possible that the system can experience anything, uh, how motivation emerges in the mind were not being answered by uh, the authorities that I met and uh, the schools that were around. And instead, I found that it was individual thinkers that had useful ideas mm -hmm. that sometimes were good, sometimes were not so good, sometimes were adopted by a large group of people, sometimes were rejected by large groups of people. But um, for me, it was much more interesting to see these minds as individuals. And in my perspective, thinking is still something that is done not in groups, that has to be done by individuals. So that motivated you to become an individual thinker yourself? I didn't have a choice. Hmm. Basically, I didn't find a group that thought in a way where I felt, okay, um, 
I can just adopt everything that everybody thinks here and now I understand how consciousness works, right? So, or how the mind works or how thinking works or what thinking even is, or what feelings are and how they're implemented and so on. So to figure all this out, I had to take a lot of um, ideas from individuals and then try to put them together in something that works for myself. And on one hand, I think it helps if you try to go down and find first principles on, <clears throat> on which you can recreate how thinking works, how languages work, what representation is, <clears throat> whether representation is necessary, how the relationship between a representing agent and the world works in general. But how do you escape the influence, once again, the pressure of the crowd? Whether it's you in responding to the, the pressure or you being swept up by the pressure. If you even just look at Twitter, the opinions of the crowd. I don't feel pressure from the crowd. I'm completely immune to that. <laughs> in the same sense, I don't have respect for authority. I have respect for what an individual is accomplishing or have a, a respect for mental firepower or... So, but it's not that I meet somebody and get slack drawed and uh, unable to speak. Um, or when a large group of people has a certain idea that is different from mine, I don't necessarily feel in intimidated, which has often been a problem for me in my life because I lack um, instincts that other people develop at a very young age and that uh, help with their self-preservation in a social environment. So I had to learn a lot of things the hard way. <laughs> yeah. So is there a practical advice you can give on how to think paradig paradigmatically, how to think independently? Or, you know, because you've kind of said, I had no choice. But I think to a degree you have a choice because you said you want to be productive. And I think thinking independently is productive if what you're curious about is understanding the world, especially when the problems are very kind of new and open. And so it seems like this is a active process. Like we can choose to do that, we can practice it. Well, there's a very basic question when you read a theory that you find convincing or interesting, how do you know? It's very interesting to figure out what are the sources of that other person, not uh, which authority can they refer to that is then taking off the burden of being truthful, but how did this authority in turn know? What is the epistemic chain to observables? What are the first principles from which the whole thing is derived? And when I was young, I was not blessed with a lot of um, people around myself who knew how to make proofs from first principles. And mm -hmm. I think mathematicians do this quite naturally. but most of the great mathematicians do not become mathematicians in school, but they tend to be self-taught because uh, school teachers tend not to be mathematicians, right? They tend not to be people who derive things from first principles. So when you ask your school teacher, why does two plus two equal four? Um, does your school teacher give you the right answer? Like um, It's a, a simple game and there are many simple games that you could play. And um, most of the, those games that you could just take different rules would not lead to an interesting arithmetic. And so it's just an exploration, but you can try what happens if you take different axioms. And here is how you build axioms and derive um, addition from them. And uh, build addition is some basically syntactic sugar in it. And so this, I wish that somebody would have opened me this vista and explained to me how I can build a language in my own mind and from which I can derive what I'm seeing and how I can, which I can make geometry and counting and um, all the number games that we are playing in our life. And on the other hand, I felt that I learned a lot of this while I was programming as a child. Mm -hmm. When you start out with a computer like a Commodore 64, who doesn't, mm -hmm. which doesn't have a lot of functionality, it's relatively easy to see how a bunch of relatively simple circuits uh, are just basically performing hashes between uh, bit patterns and how you can build the entirety of mathematics and computation on top of this and all the representational languages that you need. Man, Commodore 64 could be one of the sexiest machines ever built if I so say so myself. If we can return to uh, this really interesting idea that we started to talk about with panpsychism. <laughs> sure and uh, the complex resonated paradigm and the verses of your tweets. 
you write, instead of treating eyes, ears, and skin as separate sensory systems with fundamentally different modalities, we might understand them as overlapping aspects of the same universe, coupled at the same temporal resolution and almost inseparable from a single shared resonant model. Instead of treating mental representations as fully isolated between minds, the representations of physically adjacent observers might directly interact and produce causal effects through the coordination of the perception and behavior of world modeling observers. So the, the modalities, the distinction between modalities, let's throw that away. The distinction between the individuals, let's throw that away. So what does this interaction representations look like? And you think about how you represent the interaction of us in this room. Yeah. At some level, you can uh, the modalities are quite distinct. They're not completely distinct, but you can see this as vision. You can close your eyes, and then you don't see a lot anymore. Uh, but you still imagine how my mouth is moving mm -hmm. when you hear something, and you know that it's um, very close to uh, the sound that you can just open your eyes and you get back into this shared merged space. And uh, we also have these experiments where we notice that the way in which my lips are moving are affecting how you hear the sound. Mm. And also vice versa, the sounds that you're hearing have an influence on how you interpret some of the visual features. And so uh, the, these uh, modalities are not separate in your mind. They do are merged at some fundamental level where you are uh, interpreting the entire scene that you're in. And your own interactions in the scene are also not completely separate from the interactions of the other individual in the scene. But there is some resonance that is going on where we also uh, have a degree of shared mental representations and shared empathy due to being in the same space mm -hmm. and having vibes between each other. Vibes. So the question, though, is how deeply intervined is this multimodality, multi-agent system? Like how... I mean, this is going to the telepathy question without the woo-woo meaning of the word telepathy. It's like how, like what's going on here in this room right now? So if <laughs> telepathy would work, how could it work? Yeah. Right, so imagine that um, all the cells in your body are sending signals in a similar way as neurons are doing. Mm -hmm. right? Just by touching the other cells and sending chemicals to them, the other cells interpreting them, learning how to react to them. And they learn how to approximate functions in this way and compute behavior for the organisms. And this is something that is open to plants as well. Mm -hmm. right? So plants probably have software running on them that is controlling how the plant is working in a similar way as you have a mind that is controlling how you are behaving in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, this um, spirit of plants it is something that has been very well described by our ancestors, and they found this quite normal. But uh, for some reason, since the Enlightenment, we are treating this notion that uh, there are spirits in nature and that plants have spirits as a superstition. Mm -hmm. And I think we probably have to uh, rediscover that, that plants have software running on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we already did, right? We, we noticed that there is a control system in the plant that connects every part of the plant to every other part of the plant and produces coherent behavior in the plant. That is, of course, much, much slower than the coherent behavior in an animal like us that has a nervous system that where everything is synchronized much, much faster by the neurons. But um, what you also notice is that if a plant is sitting next to another plant, like you have a very old tree and this tree is building some kind of information highway along its cells so it can send information from its leaves to its roots and from some part of the root to another part of the roots, and there is a fungus living next to the tree, the fungus can probably piggyback on the communication between the cells of the tree and send its own signals through the tree. And vice versa, the tree might be able to send information to the fungus. Because after all, how would they build a viable firewall if that other organism is sitting next to them all the time and it's never moving away? Right? So they will have to get along. And over a long enough time frame, um, the networks of roots in the forest and all the plant, other plants that are there and uh, the uh, fungi that are there uh, might be forming something like a biological internet. So, but the, the the question there is, do they have to be touching? Is biology at a distance possible? Of course, you can use any kind of physical signal. You can use sounds, you can uh, use electromagnetic waves yeah. that are integrated over many cells. It's conceivable that uh, across um, distances, there are many kinds of information pathways. 
but also uh, our uh, planetary surface is pretty full of organisms, yeah. full of cells. So it's, everything so, is touching everything else. Yeah, and uh, it's sense. been doing this for um, many millions and even billions of years. So there was enough time for information processing networks to form. Mm -hmm. And if you think about how a mind is self-organizing, basically it needs to, in some sense, reward the cells for computing the mind, for building uh, the necessary dynamics between the cells that allow the mind to stabilize itself mm -hmm. and remain on there. But uh, if you look at these spirits of plants that are growing very close to each other in the forest and might be almost growing into each other, mm -hmm. uh, these spirits might be able even to move to some degree, not to become somewhat dislocated and shift around in, in that ecosystem, right? And um, so uh, if you think about uh, what the mind is, it's a bunch of activation waves that form coherent patterns and process information in, in a way that um, are colonizing an environment well enough to uh, allow the continuous sustenance of the mind, the uh, continuous stability and self-stabilization of the mind, um, then it's conceivable that uh, we can link into this biological internet, not ne necessarily at the speed of our nervous system, but maybe at the speed of our body and make some kind of subconscious connection to the world where we use our body as an antenna into biological information processing. Now, mm -hmm. now these ideas are completely speculative. I don't know if any of that is true. But if that was true, and if you want to explain telepathy, I think it's much uh, more likely that uh, such uh, that telepathy could be explained using such mechanisms rather than undiscovered uh, quantum processes that would break the standard model of physics. Could there be undiscovered processes that don't break? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, if you think about um, something like an internet in the forest, that is something that is borderline discovered. There are basically a lot of scientists who point out that they do observe that uh, plants are communicating the forest through root networks and send information, uh, for instance, warn each other about uh, new pests entering the forest and, and things are happening like this. So basically, uh, there is communication between plants and fungi that has been observed. Well, it's been observed, but it, we haven't plugged into it. So it's like if you observe humans, they seem to be communicating with a smartphone thing, but you don't understand how a smartphone works and how the, the mechanism of the internet works. Mm -hmm. But we're like, maybe it's possible to really understand the, the full richness of the biological internet that connects us. An interesting question is whether the communication and the organization principles of biological information processing are as complicated as the technology that we've built. Mm. They set up on very different principles, right? They simultaneously yeah. works very differently uh, in biological systems and the uh, entire thing needs to be stochastic. And uh, instead of being fully deterministic or almost fully deterministic as our digital computers are, so there is a different base protocol layer that would emerge uh, over the um, biological structure if such a thing would be happening. And again, I'm not saying here that telepathy works and not saying that this is, that this is not who, uh, but uh, what I'm saying is uh, I'm I think I'm open to a, a possibility that we see that a few bits can be traveling long distance between organisms using uh, biological information processing in ways uh, that uh, we are not completely aware of right now, and that are more similar to many of the stories that were completely normal for our ancestors. Well, this kind of interacting, intertwined representations takes us to the the big ending of your tweet series. You write, quote, I wonder if self-improving AGI might end up saturating physical environments with intelligence to such a degree that isolation of individual mental states becomes almost impossible. And the representations of all complex self-organizing agents merge permanently with each other. So that's a really interesting idea. This biological network, life network, gets so dense that it might as well be seen as one. That's an interesting, uh, what do you think that looks like? What do you think that saturation looks like? What does it feel like? I think it's a possibility. It's just a vague possibility. And I, I like to ex explain, but um, what this uh, looks like, I think that the end game of AGI is substrate agnostic. That means that uh, AGI ultimately, if it is being built, is going to be smart enough to understand how AGI works. Mm -hmm. 
This means it's not going to be better than people at AGI research and can take over in building the next generation, but it fully understands how it works and how it's being implemented. And also, of course, understands how computation works in nature, how to build new feedback loops that you can turn into your own circuits. And this means that the AGI is likely to virtualize itself into any environment that can compute. So it's not breaking free from the silicon substrate and is going to move into the ecosystems, into our bodies, our brains, and is going to merge with all the agency that it finds there. Yeah. So uh, it's conceivable that you end up with uh, completely integrated information processing across all computing systems, including biological computation on Earth. You, that we end up triggering some new step in the evolution where basically some Gaia is being built over uh, the entirety of all digital and biological computation. And um, if this happens, then basically uh, uh, everywhere around us, you will have agents that are connected and that are representing and building models of the world and their representations will physically interact. They will vibe with each other. And if uh, you find yourself into an environment, an environment that is saturated with um, modeling compute, where basically you uh, almost every grain of sand could part, be part of computation um, that is uh, at some point being started by the AI, um, you could find yourself in a situation where you cannot escape this shared representation anymore and where you indeed notice that everything in the world has one shared resonant model of everything that's happening on the planet and you notice which part you are in this thing and um, you become part of a very larger, almost holographic mind in which all the parts are observing each other and form a coherent whole. So you lose the ability to notice to notice yourself as a, as a distinct entity. No, I think that when you are conscious in your own mind, you notice yourself as a distinct entity. You notice yourself as a self-reflexive observer. And uh, I suspect that we become conscious at the beginning of our mental development, not at some very high level. Consciousness seems to be part of a training mechanism that biological nervous systems have to discover to become trainable because you cannot take a nervous system like ours and to stochastic gradient descent to spec propagation over 100 layers. Mm -hmm. right? This would not be stable on biological neurons. And uh, so instead, we start with some colonizing principle in which a part uh, of the mental representations form a notion of being a self-reflexive observer that is imposing coherence on its environment. And this spreads until the boundary of your mind. And if that boundary is no longer clear-cut because uh, AI is jumping across substrates, uh, it would be interesting to see what a global mind would look like that is basically producing a globally coherent language of thought and is um, representing everything from all the possible vantage points. That's an interesting world. The intuition that this thing grew out of is a particular mental state, and it's a state that you find sometimes in literature, for instance. Neil Gaiman describes it in The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that, or this experience, that there is a state in which you feel that you know everything that can be known, and that in your normal human mind, you've only forgotten. You've forgotten that you are the entire universe. And some people describe this um, after they've taken extremely large uh, amount of mushrooms or had a big spiritual experience uh, as uh, a hippie in their 20s, and they notice basically that they are in everything and they're uh, their body is only one part of the universe and nothing ends at their body and uh, actually everything is observing and they are part of this big observer and the big observer is focused uh, as one local point in their body and their personality and so on. But uh, we, we can basically have this oceanic state in which we have no boundaries and are one with everything. And um, a lot of meditators call this the non-dual state because you no longer have the separation between self and world. And as I said, you can explain the state relatively simply uh, without uh, panpsychism or anything else, but just by breaking down the uh, constructed boundary between self and world and our own mind. But if you combine this with the notion that uh, systems are physically interacting to the point where their representations are merging and interacting with each other, you would literally implement something like this. Mm -hmm. Right. It would still be a representational state. You would not be one with physics itself. It would still be coarse-grained. It would still be much slower than physics itself. But, uh, but it would be a representation in which you um, become aware that you're part of some kind of global information processing system, mm -hmm. like thought in the global mind. 
and a conscious thought it's that, that coexisting with many other self-reflexive thoughts. Just, I would love to observe that from a video game design perspective, how that game looks. Maybe you will after we build AGI and it takes over. But would you be able to step away, step out of the whole thing, just kind of watch, you know, the way we can now. Sometimes when I'm at a crowded party or something like this, you step back and you realize all the different costumes, all the different interactions, all the different computation, that all the individual people are at once distinct from each other and at once all the same. But it's same. already what we do, right? We can have thoughts that are integrative and we have kind of thoughts that are highly dissociated from everything else yeah. and experience themselves as separate. Yeah, but you want to allow yourself to have those thoughts. Sometimes you kind of resist it. I think that uh, it's not normative. I want, it's more descriptive. I want to understand the space of states that we can be in and that people are reporting mm -hmm. and uh, make sense of them. It's not that I believe that uh, it's your job in life to get to a particular kind of state and then you get a high score. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you do. I, I, I think you're really against this high scoring thing. I kind of like yeah, it. Yeah, you're probably very competitive and I'm not. No, not competitive. <laughs> like role-playing games like Skyrim. It's not competitive. There's a... There's a nice thing, there's a nice feeling where your experience points go up. You're not competing against anybody, but it's the world saying, you're on the right track, here's a point. That's the game saying it, it's the game economy. And I found when I was playing games and was getting addicted to these systems, then I would get into the game and hack it. So I get control over the scoring system and would no longer be subject to it. So you're not no longer playing your trying to hack it. I don't want to be addicted to anything. Mm. I want to be in charge. I want to have agency over what I do. Ad addiction is the loss of control for you? Yes. Addiction means that you're doing something compulsively. Mm. And the opposite of free will is not determinism, it's compulsion. You don't want to lose yourself in the, in the addiction to something nice. Addiction to love, to the, to the pleasant feelings we humans experience. No, I find this uh, gets old. Hmm. Right, it's, you, I don't want to have the best possible emotions. I want to have the most appropriate emotions. I don't want to have the best possible experience. I want to have an adequate experience that is serving my goals, the stuff that I find meaningful in this world.